work, my boots on and lace them up. Hard work, work. Got another day to work. Hard work, work. Hard work. That way you can see better images of the tapeworms. And I admit, I admit also the sharks and stingrays too, so, but, you know. All right. I am you know, have been invited here today to talk to you about the research that my students and I have been doing over the last several decades here at the University of Connecticut. Because you are librarians, I feel compelled to and will, I hope, convince you of the importance of evolutionary research in terms of the classification of organisms, which has a direct impact on you when the names of things change and then you all say, why did they do that? <laughs> I'm going to show you that it's key that we do that and that there's reason behind it and it makes things better, in addition to talking about the evolution and coevolutionary relationships in this system. However, because you probably don't know much about this system, perhaps you know about the hosts, but I'm guessing maybe not so much about the tapeworms, I'm going to give you just a few slides at the beginning that you should consider to be sort of a primer in terms of elasmobranchs and tapeworms. We'll start with elasmobranchs, okay? You, you know that sharks are elasmobranchs. I wonder if you also know that skates and guitar fish and of course stingrays are also elasmobranchs, okay? So as elasmobranchs go, the sharks and rays are the elasmobranchs then. They're the cartilaginous fish, except for ratfish. We don't deal with ratfish, you can ask me about that later. <laughs> Their parasites aren't that interesting actually. All right. Where in an elasmobranch would you find a tapeworm? Well, here's just an illustration of an elasmobranch. And before I tell you where you'd find a tapeworm, I just want to point out that elasmobranchs actually make terrific hosts. If uh, one of my students and I actually did this, you were to take all of the records of parasites of elasmobranchs and combine them on a single image, you would see something that looked like this. Essentially, all of the organs of an elasmobranch have been found to host parasites at different points in time. And this is a composite of all species of sharks and stingrays, but it's kind of interesting because one of my other, you know, jobs here is to make you aware of, give you an appreciation of the beauty and importance of parasites overall. Okay, so, sushi, that, we're going to come back to that at the end. Sorry, we're coming back to that at the end. All right, so diversity of different kinds of parasites live in sharks and stingrays or elasmobranchs. And these are just some images of the different groups that you find in, par in you know, parasitizing sharks and stingrays. Um, and I'm not going to go over any of those except to point out that by far the most diverse, speciose and interestingly cool, and I'll show you that, parasites of elasmobranchs are the tapeworms, okay? And not just because they're morphologically spectacular, but because there's way more species of tapeworms in elasmobranchs than any other group of parasites. And that's not just because I study them. That's true. It's a truism. Okay. So where now in an elasmobranch would you find the tapeworms? Well, it turns out they're really easy to collect because all of the tapeworms of elasmobranchs, the tapeworms are also known more scientifically as the cestodes, live in a single organ called the spiral intestine. All right, now here's your primer on elasmobranch anatomy. Consider the anatomy of a shark or a stingray, all right? This is pretty much it. You have two regions to the stomach, so cardiac stomach, pyloric stomach, and that's followed by an organ called the spiral intestine. All right, here's your test, your quiz. What's missing from this picture? If I were showing you the anatomy of um, like a lamb or a sheep or some vertebrate, some mammal, what, what would you see here instead of a spiral intestine? Small intestine, Small intestine and large, large intestine i.e. meters and meters of gut that a parasitologist would have to look through to find the parasites. Turns out, elasmobranchs have a single organ, the spiral intestine, that performs all of the functions of the small and large intestine in other groups of vertebrates. So basically, we consider the spiral intestine to be like the parasite treasure chest of the sea. <laughs> because all of the tapeworms live, essentially all, in that single organ, and that organ is quite short. It's complicated, but it's short and thus easy to collect, and I'll come back to that. All right, a little bit more about spiral intestines. This is kind of your party trivia on spiral intestines. Hardly anybody knows this, so you should. Um, there's two different kinds of spiral intestine configurations, okay? The first, let me do that one more time. The first image shows you just line, oops, maybe it doesn't. Let's try it again. So there's a line drawing of the most common type of spiral intestine called the conica spiral intestine. Okay, and then that's a line drawing of the less common type, the scroll type, and you should consider that kind of like, my students call it dish rag on a stick, because it's a single sheet of mucosa that rolls up inside of the outer, layer, the outer layers of the spiral intestine. So those are line drawings, 
And that's what, this is an actual example of a, the one type of spiral intestine, the Konica spiral from a nurse shark. And that's an example of a scroll type spiral intestine actually from a blue shark. Because it turns out this type of spiral intestine is only found in hammerhead sharks and carcharhinid sharks. So blue sharks, whaler sharks, brown sharks, things you're probably used to sort of see. Okay, so that, when, yes? Is the single intestine um, specific to elasmobranchs or do like bony fish have a single intestine? It's a great question. Elasmobranchs have the single, the combined, large and small, in a, in a, a spiral intestine. So do paddlefish <laughs> and sturgeon. <laughs> and that's it. So there's a very odd distribution of it. And it's thought that it's actually a convergent feature in those other groups of fish. So, so there's a single evolution of the spiral intestine in elasmobranchs, and then it's a convergent, so a different evolutionary novelty in things like paddlefish. Okay? So, that's the most common type of spiral intestine, and that's where you find the tapeworms. All right, so what I'm showing you here is, look, you have to admit they're gorgeous. All right, <laughs> so what I'm showing you here is tapeworms, okay, in a Petri dish. This is what they actually look like in real life. So this is the spiral intestine of a shark ray, and it's just absolutely riddled with tapeworms. No, don't look at it like that. Smile. <laughs> Come on. They're lovely, okay? And one of the things I want to mention is that tapeworms of mammals tend to be gigantic. Okay, the largest tapeworms known are tapeworms of things like dolphins and so on. They can be like meters and meters long. On average, the tapeworms of elasmobranchs are very tiny. The average size is probably a centimeter. One of my past students, Kirsten Jessen, has the record for the smallest tapeworm ever, 300 micrometers in one of the rays of manta, in one of the species of manta relatives. Okay, so on average they're small. I had to look long and hard to find a spiral intestine where I could actually show you the worms in it. That's why I picked that one. Okay, but normally they're kind of minuscule. And again, I'm going to come back to that, but pretty darn spectacular. Let's see if this is going to go. Okay. Now we're going to do a little primer in tapeworm morphology, okay? So let's talk a little bit about the body of a tapeworm, okay? So cestode morphology. Well, the most important part of a tapeworm is the part it uses to attach to its host. That's the scolex, okay? So that's the part that's actually going to attach to the mucosa of the spiral intestine. And I'm going to be showing you lots of images of the scolex, and I'll come back to that. Tapeworms are weird in many respects, in addition to the fact that they're spectacularly beautiful and really cool. Um, they have a body that consists of basically something called the strobola that it's produced at this germinative zone behind the scolex. Okay, and that strobola is actually made up, it's made up of a chain, okay, so there's one, two, three, four, five, so on and so on, different numbers in different species, a chain of structures called proglottids. All right, tapeworms live in the gut of their host. Why do you think that is? That's almost the only place you'll find them in their host. Nutrients, Nutrients because, do tapeworms have their own gut? No, no. no they're gutless wonders. <laughs> they're they lack a gut, okay? That means these proglottids are pretty much packed with just reproductive structures. Tapeworms are all about reproducing. It's kind of the perfect scenario, right? They don't have a gut, they live in the gut take nutrients, and all they really do is reproduce. All right, so um, because they're tiny, we do a lot of the work characterizing tapeworms using electron microscopy. So what I'm showing you here is, this is a scanning electron micrograph of the anterior end of a tapeworm that looks like this. All of the images I'm going to show you henceforth in my talk will just be electron micrographs of that anterior end of the scolex. And I have to say that's in part because I showed you what they look like in a petri dish, and even I would admit this is a little more spectacular, so it makes them a little more palatable to audiences, but it also allows us to show you the features a little more effectively. Okay, so they don't have a gut, I just mentioned that, but what they do have is, associated with their body, they have specialized structures called microtreches. We think some of these actually help absorb the nutrients. Okay, so they're very, they're perfect. They're, they're the perfect organisms to be living in the gut of a host. All right, that's your primer on tapeworms. All right, now let's do, I just want to show you the interface before we start talking about evolution and diversity and so on in this system. So now what I'm going to do is, I showed you some spiral intestine images, I showed you some tapeworm images, now I'm going to show you the interface. So I'm going to show you tapeworms attached to the surface of the gut. Let's go back then to the nurse shark, okay? So Gingliumistomum serratum, the Atlantic nurse shark. This is the spiral intestine shown here. I'm going to show you this tapeworm attached to the surface of this gut. And there it is. Okay, so what you can see is I've taken a, so here's the mucosal surface. That's the absorptive surface in any organism. The mucosal surface in this species has little, these little pits. And this is a cross-section of that tapeworm attached. 
Okay, so there's the worm, and that's where the section is. Okay, so you can actually see there's the little hooks. That's because you're picking up on that part of the worm. Notice how intimate that association is, all right? That is like the per, again, I, as I mentioned, they're spectacular associates of these hosts. Okay, so that's one example. Now let me show you that interface in a different species using a different method, just so I, I'm sure you sort of grasp the concept here. So let's consider, let's look now at the spiral intestine of the little dwarf Wipray, Hymentura walga. Okay, so now I'm showing you an uninfected mucosal surface. So it's a look at the mucosal surface with scanning electron microscopy. Turns out this species has ex almost the same surface as, as the nurse shark, only it's kind of neat because you're actually getting now to see it in three dimensions. Now I'm going to show you this worm, similar in morphology to the one I just showed you in the Atlantic nurse shark, attached to that surface. There it is. Okay? So now you've seen like a section, and you've also seen it from the standpoint of scanning electron microscopy. All right, so I am telling you about this for a reason, well, apart from you just said it was cool, so I don't have to say anything else. Okay. <laughs> okay, now where I'm going with this is different species of sharks and stingrays have mucosal surfaces that look different. They have different configurations. What does our mucosal surface look like? What are the elements on our mucosal surface? So I showed you crypts. I showed you little pits in two species of elasmobranch. What do we have? Yeah, what do we have? Villi. Villi, right? We have, we have like positive features, right? We have finger-like structures. Well, it turns out in some elasmobranchs, you actually even have variation in the mucosal surface within the same species, okay? And so I'm actually going to show you now the long-nosed saw shark, and I'm going to show you what the surface looks like in two different regions of the spiral intestine and the morphology and attachment modes of the worms that attach in those different regions. And this was actually work done in my lab a number of years ago by an undergrad student, Valerie McKenzie, um, for her honors thesis, just so you know. So as part of her thesis, she described three new genera of tapeworms. One of them was Bibersobothrium gouldeni. Let's look at that one first. And I, I want to just mention to you that, so Bibersobothrium has that's the scolex, just a line drawing of the scolex. Its scolex is divided into four portions, so you're seeing this, those structures are called bathridia. You're seeing one here, one here, and then there's two on the back, just like the other examples I showed you. In this instance, the scolex, each of the bathridia is, is made up of like a double pouch. Um, we ended up calling it bibursa bathroom. <laughs> Val wanted to call it brazero bathroom when we started. I'm like, no, <laughs> that would be good. Okay, so let's look at that worm attached to the surface of the host. And here it is. So this is a section. Here, we'll show you the, okay, it's a section through that part of the worm. And what you can see is the surface of the gut where this worm attaches has these villi, just like we do, okay? And this worm attaches by grabbing one villus in each of these pouches. So see, there's, there's a bathridium. There's one pouch, one, another pouch, and each one has a villus. Two villi there, two villi there, two villi there. Perfect. Now... Let's take a look further back in the intestine of this same species, and let's see how a different species, Flexibothrium runkii, attaches. I'm going to show you that worm attached to the surface, at, and I'm going to be showing you a section through an area of the bathridia, where, the scolex, where that line is. And there it is. Can you see it? Oh, those animations don't reverse. Interesting. Let's do it again. So there it is. Okay, now first of all, before I highlight the worm, notice, look how different this surface is here from what it is here. See how it's these little ridge-like structures, anastomoting ridges? So the worm that attaches there morphologically is totally different than the one that attaches elsewhere, and there you can see it there. Okay, so you can have variation within a species. There's definitely variation among species, but the, in many cases, the morphology of that attachment structure is nicely fitting the morphology of the region of the gut in which they attach. Which gives us, we believe, a lot of the spectacular morphological diversity that you see in tapeworms of elasmobranchs. Okay? So all of those are different groups of tapeworms that parasitize a whole different suite of, of elasmobranchs. And we do believe that a lot of that morphological diversity has come about evolutionarily <coughs> because they're attaching to different species of sharks and stingrays and the gut looks different at their sites of attachment. Okay, and again, I just did this so you can see the spectacular diversity there. Okay, now we're going to do, a, we're going to move into classification a little bit. Let's talk about classification. So I've picked, um, in order to illustrate this point, a group that, I, I don't know plants, so I'm going to do insects, okay? So let's consider some of the major groups of classification of insects. Does anybody know what order, no, see, I just gave that away, sigh. Okay, well, <laughs> these are orders of insects. <laughs> 
Okay, that's a major, so you know, the, the way the categories of classification go, you'd have kingdom, phylum, order. Can you do the rest of it? Family, class, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Kids play catch over farmer green stables. Yeah, it's easy. It's good. Just that's what I tell my class. Okay, so orders of classification of insects. And now, and you, you're familiar with these, right? I think you are. Let's try it. What are these? Common name. Excellent. Flies. Okay, now we're going to try it with taprooms. Let's go. There they are. No. I aspire to show that slide someday and people go, Cathedus cephalidians, Lidobothridians, Trepaner, you know, not going to happen. But my point is, the category of classification that we work with in tapeworms is the category order. And because I didn't think maybe you'd recognize them in tapeworms, I wanted to show you the equivalent in insects. These are large categories of classification. And one of the things I'm going to show you that we've been doing is we've been working really hard to make it so not just this category of classification, but all categories below that are representative of natural groupings. That is, they reflect the phylogenetic relationships, the evolutionary relationships of the tapeworms. Okay, and this is where we're going to come back to stability. And we do recognize, the taxonomists of the world recognize that things have been a little unstable. It's made it hard not just for librarians, but for ecologists they are always whining about this sort of thing. This is being taped, so I'm going to say that again. Ecologists are always whining about how unstable <laughs> things are. But because of modern methods of looking at evolutionary trees, we are starting to move towards substantial stability. So we're getting to a point where things won't be changing anymore, and if we can come up with a system that reflects the evolutionary relationships, it's perfect because there's a lot of power in terms of information content there. And again, I'm going to illustrate this to you. So, so when we started this work now several de decades ago, this was sort of the extent. There were six orders of tapeworms <coughs> that parasitize elasmobranchs recognized. I'm not talking about any of the other orders of tapeworms. There's 19 orders. Well. Prior to this, let's say there were about 12 orders of tapeworms if you count everything. Lasmobranchs host much of that diversity because they host half of the orders recognized. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I want to go into some of the research goals, some of the things we've been doing with this system, moving towards not just you know, talking about the evolutionary relationships of the elasmobranchs and their tapeworms, but I do want to talk about that issue of making classifications consistent with evolutionary relationships. And then I'm going to finish up with the horror that we've discovered in terms of trying to look at coevolution in this system, this host parasite system. Okay. So first of all, let's talk about evolutionary trees. And I just wanted to mention that, you know, up to about like a decade ago, we would actually generate phylogenetic trees using morphological data in many, many cases. And then as time went on, we started adding more and more molecular data to our tree generating processes so that nowadays, even I who am a diet in the wool morphologist, we generally generate our phylogenetic trees using molecular data. Okay, that's kind of the reality of our life nowadays. But to put the morphology in perspective, because it turns out that um, there are way more elasmobranch species out there than people recognize. There's a lot of novelty in terms of species of elasmobranch. We had a large project in Borneo with some, um, we were collaborating with someone from the University of Kansas and then a group from CSIRO in Tasmania, Australia. Just as part of that project alone, we discovered seven or eight new species of stingrays and sharks on the island of Borneo. And one of the stingrays was, you can't miss it. It was like six feet in diameter disc and had a tube mouth. You know, it's like a vacuum cleaner ray, and you're like, really? And it's just because people aren't out there looking with a mind to carefully identifying the different taxa. So, no matter what we do, we always include the host in our analyses. Okay, and we've come up with a standardized protocol where the gene of choice, in terms of looking at both phylogenetic relationships superficially and certainly for helping identify the sharks and rays, is a, a mitochondrial gene known as NADH2, and it's about a thousand base pairs long. So, anytime we collect a host, we will collect tissue and we will sequence that gene. Okay. In terms of the tapeworms, we actually have two genes that seem to work pretty well for the kinds of questions we're asking right now, and they are both a large and a small subunit of ribosomal DNA, and that gives you about how many base pairs long they are. Um, Ken talked to you a little bit about how their projects are moving towards using much, much more sequence data to generate trees. We too have, we actually have a large project to sort of 
hunt for other genes to try to help with relationships. It turns out these actually work pretty well. Others give you some additional resolution, but we haven't quite figured out which ones would be better than these. So these are kind of our standard, you know, th this is what we use as standards now, not to say we can't improve that in the future. Okay, so that's the data. Those are the character data we're gonna use to generate the phylogenetic trees, okay? But because molecular data at this point cannot really be obtained from formal and fixed specimens, it sadly means that we have to collect fresh material of almost everything if we want to actually add the molecular component to our work. So sadly, we get to travel around the world collecting <laughs> fresh material. It's, you know. And so the other thing that this allows us to do is many of the historical records of tapeworms from species of sharks and stingrays suffer from problems with issues associated with the identity of the sharks and stingrays. So in going out into the field and collecting de novo, we also can take tissue from the hosts and we have a very standard protocol for every host is given a unique ID number. We always take a set of images, digital images, and those are available. Um, you can search them basically based on the collection codes, which I'm showing you there. At our, we have a MySQL database, which I can talk about a little later, but it's tapeworms.ucon.edu, yes, and UConn IT actually set that up for us. And so basically anyone in the world can see any of these data because one of the things that's happening is when people look at the images, the spotted eagle ray, for example, the spotted eagle ray, Edubata snarinaria, you guys know what that is if you're black with white spots, beautiful creature. It was supposed to have a global distribution. It turns out once you start looking at the pictures, the DNA, and more importantly, the parasites, it's actually six different species worldwide. And one of the reasons we figured that out is you could go into the database and look at pictures from Baja, Taiwan, Australia, and go, I don't think so. <laughs> so it allows for comparative assessment, but for anybody, okay? So let's then return to the notion that, so one of the things we've had to do in order to come up with our new evolutionary scenarios for all of these different tape rooms of the Lazar ranks is do a lot of new collecting. Since I've been at the University of Connecticut, I came here in 1985, this map summarizes the places in the world where my students and or I have been to collect fresh material. So we have a global look at tapeworms of elasmobranchs. One of the things that's interesting about this host parasite system is there's only about 1,300 species of elasmobranchs and maybe a few hundred more once the little outliers that haven't been described get done. It's possible in my career Kent can attest to this, that we could actually describe tapeworms from all of the species of elasmobranchs in the world and be done. Not like people, for example, I feel sorry for people who work on beetles in rainforest canopies. It's never going to end. They're never going to be done. We could actually be done. But we are starting now especially to, to pull together our global picture. Okay, so as a result of those collections and work with collaborators around the world, we have a really pretty good handle on elasmobranch diversity. Like I said, there's about 1,300 species of elasmobranchs. These images actually come from a book by Peter Lass and John Stevens, The Elasmobranchs of Australia, just to give you, you know, some idea of the variation that you can see in morphology. All of those things are elasmobranchs, and more importantly, all of them host tapeworms, got to say. <laughs> so, yes? For projects like the Borneo Project, where the, we had an NSF grant to do sharks and rays and their parasites of Borneo, we collected some whole animals and brought them to the Cal Academy and to a museum in CSIRO and also deposited some in country. For the most part, though, that's pretty unwieldy. So what we do is we take the images and tissue, and then we remove the spiral intestine, and that comes back to Yukon. So we do, in fact, have the largest collection of spiral intestines in the world here at Yukon. <laughs> just saying, yeah. Okay. So, you know, um, and one of the things we do do that I just want to mention also is um, w when we're looking for diversity, our best resource is the local fishermen in any area. So what we do is we go into an area and we go, have you seen this? Have you seen this? And, and almost every single time they're like, oh yeah, it's over there. You know, it doesn't matter the country. You show them a picture and they'll go get it almost. And we've gotten really, like, in, so it means that I will often walk up to a fisherman and go, so, I'll give you $5 if I can have the guts of that animal. And they're like... <laughs> Okay, <laughs> and I've, I don't think we've ever had a fisherman say, no, we don't want you to clean it. No, no, you know, so it works out really great. And it also means in a lot of cases we're working with animals that have already been fished, so we're getting data. You know, we do to do some of our own collecting if it's taxa that people aren't getting, you know, there's some things that just there's, there are 
very common, but nobody eats them. Like electric rays, for example. Have you ever tried to eat an electric ray? The whole thing is an electric organ. It's a big gelatinous mass. Ugh. But, you know, I forget why I told you that. Anyway, so, but that works out really well for us. Okay, so I just wanted to mention, in terms of tapeworm diversity, every species on this slide was new. Yeah, we've, we've all, we are making, we're just cranking through the descriptions of all of these. We're actually almost done with everything on that slide. Time to make, time to make a new one. But the diversity was truly un underestimated when I first started working on this system. Okay, so since we've, um, you know, don't have a huge amount of time, I just wanted to give you a little perspective of how we go into the field and do this work. So I'm just going to show you like a few little field pictures of places in the world to give you sort of, a, one of the things, they look different, they're different countries obviously, but you'll see there's a certain similarity to we're working with fishermen, the fish are laying on the dock, we're, you know, looking for boats or whatever. So let's look at, so consider for example Thailand and in the, the bottom left hand side of each slide it just tells you a little bit about what we got in the locality, like this was great. These were boats were coming in in droves and the fishermen were really, really helpful in Thailand. Except in Thailand, it turns out, spiral intestine's a delicacy. <laughs> so we had competition. We've never had competition. I walked into the fish market and there was this big silver pan with a pile of spiral intestines. I'm like, ah! Oh. So, but it turns out it was only for one species, so. Okay, and then Madagascar was also really, really interesting. You know, this was really hard collecting though because there's not, it's, it's very low-key collecting. People don't really eat elasmobranchs in Madagascar, so. We ended up doing some of our own fishing. This is, we spent a couple of nights on a shrimp trawler. All very. Um, the coast of Senegal is one of our best collecting sites. We've actually, this is a great place for me to take students into the field because it's, it's a really fantastic country. The people are really friendly. And their diversity of elasmobranchs is spectacular and they catch them. This is um, the fishermen on the beach of Wakamal wearing Yukon baseball caps. <laughs> actually, if you were in the world and you see someone with a Yukon baseball cap, <laughs> if it's a fisherman, that's for sure. Okay, so you know you sort of get the idea. We do that. We you know have a very standard protocol um, for collecting, and then over the course of the last you know few decades, then we've collected um, tissue and specimens from 7,295 elasmobranch specimens. Although I just got back from Ecuador, where, by the way, I wanted to mention in Ecuador, we met more children named Darwin than any other place. Yeah, it was really interesting. So, como se llama? Darwin. Como se llama? Dar Darwin. Dar oh, nice. So, and right now we have parasites from 515 of 1300 of the world's elasmobranch species, give or take, okay? So, we're getting there. All right, so now let's talk about some results. So, that's kind of the methods of how we go about doing it. All right, so I wanted to just show you this because it gives you an idea of like what the sequence data look like, okay? So, all I did is I took a little portion of the data. So, remember I said for ND2, it's about 1,000 bases long. So, this would be one and it would go to 1,000. And for a 28S, you know, it's about that size. 18S is a little longer. You're talking about like, so when we give you that number of base pairs, it's the number of characters and it's just how many ATC or whatever, however, however many nucleotides you have in the sequence of DNA and then the character, is, the character is the position and the character state is whether it's an A, a T, a C or G, whatever. So it's a fairly simplistic analysis. And then just to show you how a matrix looks, then these would be your species. So species one has that sequence, species two has that sequence and so on and so on, okay? But out to however many bases depending on the gene we're dealing with. And then what we do is to look at the evolutionary relationships and first I'm going to talk about the evolutionary relationships among the elasmobranchs because remember, we want to talk, we want to learn about patterns and processes underlying the co-evolutionary relationships. That means we have to have trees for the hosts and trees for the worms. And because it just turns out that there isn't a lot of work being done out there on trees for the hosts. We've actually played, my lab and actually a collaborator, a past grad student, a PhD student of mine who's now a professor at University of Kansas, Kirsten Jensen, she and I have been doing a lot of work with people like Gavin Naylor, previously of Florida State, now at the College of Charleston, to actually generate the most comprehensive phylogenetic trees for elasmobranch. So let's talk about that first. Okay, so to generate a robust phylogenetic tree, I showed you the data matrix, or at least like a mini version of a data matrix. There are several different methods you can use to generate the phylogenetic tree, and I'm not really gonna go into these, but I just wanted to show you, you know, like, you've probably heard these terms if you're looking at evolutionary literature, so maximum parsimony, maximum likelihood, Bayesian inference. Um, in my opinion, if your tree, the more robust your tree, the more likely these different analyses and different sorts of data give you the same answer. I actually am a fan of consensus among data. Okay, so for the elasmobranchs, 
In 2012, we actually published for the first time the sequence data and the trees for 4,200 specimens of elasmobranchs that represented about half of the world's diversity of elasmobranchs. And we got something that looks like this. We won't go into that in detail, but it's out there. We also did a book chapter to sort of, this is actually all of the specimens, and then the book chapter just does the species. So my point is we have a real, what we believe is a really robust tree of elasmobranch relationships now. And just to sort of give you sort of a, this is an overview just at the ordinal level of the elasmobranchs. One of the things that does seem to be the case, at least with the tree we generated, is the stingrays form a natural group, and the sharks form a natural group. Okay, so if you've ever heard the term monophyletic, this is a monophyletic group because it represents the descendants, all of the descendants of a common ancestor, and this is a natural group because it's the descendants, all of the descendants of a common ancestor, okay? And I'm going to come back to that when we talk about classification. What this means is, if our tree is correct, it's okay to still talk about two groups of elasmobranchs, rays or stingrays, or sometimes they're called batoids, and sharks. Okay, good, they're natural. And that means all sorts of things biologically and potentially interesting things from the parasite standpoint as well. Okay, so, but I want to spend more time because it's my area and those are just hosts for us, looking at, talking about, looking at the evolutionary relationships among the cestodes. Okay, so we also recently published the most comprehensive phylogeny of tapeworm, um, of elasmobranch tapeworm relationships. And it looks something like this. Don't worry about the details. But what I want to talk to you about is some of the things that came from that tree. You have to trust me that we think the, the evolutionary relationships are robust. That is, that they're the true ones. That might not be the case, and we'll continue to add genes and other taxa and other characters to, uh, sorry, other taxa and other genes to try to check, to try to verify this. But right now, it is looking like it's fairly stable as we add additional species. Okay, so. I'm going to talk about the results of our evolutionary work in the context of classification, okay? Because it's near and dear to my heart, and I really want people to understand why we seem to be so, like, whimsical, which we're not, in terms of what we do with classification. So this is going to be a yellow set of slides, because I want it emblazoned in your head. So whenever we talk about this issue, I want you to think about the yellow slides. And I'm going to talk about, so uh, that big tree I showed you, I'm going to talk about a sub-portion of that tree. And it's the portion that involves the order Diphyllidia. Okay, so one of those major orders. And this is work that was actually done with, again, Kirsten Jensen, but also Fernanda Marquez from University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, and um, Roman Kukta from the Czech Academy um, in Česka Budovic. All right. When we started, the order included 50 species, okay, and they were organized into two genera. Two of the species were in the genus Ditracobothridium, and the rest were in the genus Echinobothrium. Okay, so the first thing I want you to recognize is this is fine. There's only two species. It's the naked group, if you like. There's no, this is the scolex. There's no armature associated with anything there. But look at the morphological diversity that you see among the species of Echinobothrium. I'm just saying, okay, just to get you started. So that, but that was the scenario up, up until a year ago. So what we did is we collected broadly across the world and got as many different species of diphyllidians in ethanol as we could, and we conducted phylogenetic analyses, and we actually used Mr. Bayes and Garley, so two of the three methods that I talked to you about, to generate a tree of the relationships from, and again, this was two genes, okay, so it's over 2,000 base pairs of data. This is the tree of evolutionary relationships that we got. Okay, and again, don't worry about the species. We had some replicates of specimens and so on. I'm actually now going to show you a cartoon of that tree so I can make the point that I would like to make about how it's really important to actually change the classification. So let's work with this tree, okay? So, so in this tree, I've just taken like entire groups or clades or monophyletic groups and I re oh, sorry, and represent them as, as triangles, you know, so this big group here is that triangle in my tree, okay? So don't worry, don't sweat the details, let's just talk about the general tree. Okay, so let's, let's move that over so we can deal with it. Okay, and of course in any phylogenetic analysis you use out groups to help you polarize your characters. Don't really worry about that, but I just wanted you to recognize they're on the tree as well. Okay, now let's talk about that notion that the 50 species of diphyllidians should be organized into one genus, a kind of bothrium, and another genus, which has 48 species, and the other genus, Ditracobothridium, with two. There's the phylogenetic relationships. There's Ditracobothridium. Here's where the species assigned to a kind of come out in the tree. 
Oh no. Okay, let's talk about natural groupings again. So here's a kind of bothrium. Well, Dytrachobothridium is fine, and there's only what, one species in the analysis, so we can't say much from that. But what we can say is, remember, a natural group, a monophyletic group, what we aspire for in terms of our classifications should be all of the descendants of a common ancestor. Okay, well, there's a kind of bothrium species. There's the common ancestor of that whole group. Are all of the descendants of that common ancestor in the genus a kind of bathroom? No, shoot. Which one is it? Which one's missing? This one, right? That species is put in a different <laughs> genus. What that means is you could say, well, let's just move Dytrachobothridium to a kind of bathroom and be done with it, which would be cheap and easy and lazy, in my opinion, because. <laughs> I already showed you all that morphological diversity in a kind of bathroom, and we want to be able to recognize that diversity, okay? So let's consider an alternative. We didn't do this one, obviously. We will restrict the concept of a kind of bathroom to this group, this clade, this monophyletic group. We're going to call it a kind of bathroom in its strict sense. And we picked that one because in taxonomy, there is the concept of the type species. The type species is, is end all be all. Does anybody? know of type species. When I say type species, does anybody know what that means? Yay! Yes, you're librarians. We love this crowd. So type species are re reign supreme. So there's a type specimen of a type species, and it's the type of a genus and a family and so on. The type species of a kind of bothrium is here in the analysis. It tells us this has to be a kind of bothrium. You can't do this one, you can't do anything else. That, if you're going to restrict it, it would have to be that one. And we'll pick one that's a natural group, right? So this works fine because this is a nice clade, monophyletic group, where it has, if I pick this, it's the, all of the descendants of this common ancestor. Great, okay. And here's what we did with the others, and I'm going to explain why. Okay, so for each of these groups, the one in blue, we ended up establishing a new genus. And that's because, assuming our tree is correct, and we could be wrong, but like I said, it's got good taxon coverage, it's robust, it was identical topology with different analyses, you know, and so on, we feel pretty good about the tree. It will allow us then to have this group, again, all of the descendants of a common ancestor, this group, descendants of a common ancestor, this is actually monotypic, so there's only one species in it. Dytrache existed, this will be all of the descendants of that common ancestor, and then a kind of bothrium. Okay, and you're like, well, isn't that just semantics? Come on, that was just about making new names. No, watch, I'm going to show you. Okay, here's where the power comes in. I'm going to take the tree, and I've just mapped in color the features that were the ones that varied when I showed you the kind of bathroom at the beginning, that slide. Now let's take a look at how the, so that's an overview, but that's a little complicated. Now let's take a look at each of those individual genera and what it allows us to do. So first we'll consider Halicyoncum, our first new genus. Okay, well it turns out Elysioncum, once we have that tree and you go back and look, has a unique feature in that it has little hooklets here that are in a continuous band. That's unique to all species of Elysioncum. So even the species I didn't include in the, we didn't include in that analysis, we can move to this genus because they have that feature. What it's telling us is that, you know, at this point on the tree, let's go back for one second, that continuous band of hooklets is a feature to allow you to recognize that whole clade. None of these others have it. Oh, that's easy. Okay. Not for you, but it's good for us. Okay. All right. Then let's look at Ahamulina. Okay. So Ahamulina, we established as a genus. Ahamulina turns, to be almost, turns out to be almost naked, except it has these weird ephemeral hooks up here at the anterior end. That's a great feature for recognizing species in the genus Ahamulina. And meanwhile, I'm showing you the hosts in these different cases, but I'm not going to say much about that right now. What about Andocodoncum? And I want to say Andocodoncum was a puzzle. When we first did our paper, we just called it New Genus. And then Lauren Abbott, an undergrad working in my lab for her honors thesis, actually figured out a character to allow us to recognize the members of that genus. Okay? And so in the paper, we didn't have a character, so we called it New Genus, period. <laughs> and what Lauren figured out is that in Andocodoncum, the hooklets actually alternate. So there's a unique feature about these hooklets that you find in that group. Okay? All right, what about one that's a little, well, Dytrache, of course, existed, and it's the naked one, right? So Dytrache is the one that has nothing, no armature. It's very boring in terms of cestode morphology. But the if you find a naked one, it's a member of the genus Dytrachobothridium. 
Okay, and then what about Corona cestus? This is one that puzzled us. We never liked this being in the genus Echinobothrum because it differs substantially from the others. And the difference is that it has this corona of spines around the base of its, the apical part of its scolex. Any species you find that has that is a member of this genus. Okay, and in fact, we just got back from um, doing some collecting where we got we were collecting in Korea, and we got a new, another species from a different species of smoothhound shark that we sequenced, and it actually did come out with the other corona cesta. So we've actually been able to test that recently. So great feature. And then Echinobothrum sensu stricto turns out to be the species that has just single non-alternating hooklets here on the scolex. Okay, so what that means then is we now have a really good picture and features to allow us to recognize each of these different groups. And I would argue, I swear, no, I don't quite swear, but I believe it's stable enough that from this point forward, and not just in our groups, but in most groups, because we now have both the phylogenetic methods and the kinds of, we're able to de generate the kinds of data required, we are going to approach stability. So if you look at how many times you've had to rename things or depending on how you catalog whatever you're doing, it's, we're at the asymptote. You're not going to have to do it much more. For a while we were on the slope where you're like, really? It's a kind of bathroom now, it's like track it three now, it's endocodime now, it's, oh, I hate it. No, we're there. We're asymptoting out because we are getting better at doing taxonomy because we can do it in the from the standpoint of evolution. Okay, so, oops, sorry about that. So what we, what we did then is we went from basically this scenario where we had, you know, 50 species in two genera, two species of ditrachy, everything else in a kino, regardless of this morphology, to a scenario, oops, sorry, to a scenario that looks like this, okay, where we have, yes, the naked genus, and then we took a kind of bathroom and we divided it up. And those features I told you about work. So if you see this, you know you have a corona cestus. If you see the continuous band, you know you have a lysianchum. If you see the non-alternating two bands, you know you have a kind of bathroom, naked but with weird hooks at the apex, ahamulina, and alternating hooklets and docodonchum. And it seems to be working. So now we have stability. Okay, so hopefully those names will stay. And you can see that now we have a better spread of the species as well. Okay, and there were host associations here that I didn't go into, but so for example, this group is only found in triacid sharks. This is found primarily in skates. This is a group that's found primarily in the bat rays and so on. So there's host associations that go along with this as well. Can I ask a question about your naming? Yes, yes. So the corona seems like it's named based on the morphological features. Yep. Yes, but the, co the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature allows you, um, it has very specific rules about how you generate names, and the rules are pretty flexible, they're pretty broad, I guess. The only thing you can, things that are against the rules, for example, I can't name a species after myself. We are discouraged from naming species, or, you know, from generating names for species that represent political slurs or, you know, so there are, so there are some rules associated with it, but there, I could have just picked patron, you know, I'm actually a big fan of patronyms, which is naming species after people who helped us discover the species. So the fishermen across the world actually have tapeworm species named after them. So do, for example, one of the past VPs for research, one of the past provosts here at UConn, Jim Calhoun, we named one after. Doug Berman of NPR, I got a call from, from his, uh, from Michael, Danforth saying, hi, Michael Danforth of NPR. I'm like, oh, why are you calling me? So we were wondering, Doug Berman's turning 50 next, you know, turning 50, and we would like to have a tapeworm named after him. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure, that would, that sounds like such an honor for him, yeah. And, and then they, and then they said, he goes, I said, well, when would you need it? Because it's a process that takes some time. That having been said, we're always doing it. He said, oh, well, this is the part that's a little jerky. Next Thursday, and I went, really? <laughs> <laughs> so we had one we were naming that we switched, and we actually named it after him. And so that episode, this was last year. You know, at the end, they sign off. This is, wait, wait, don't tell me. When they sign off, Doug the blah, blah, blah. It actually says, Doug the Worm King Berman. <laughs> so... But anyway, so you can do it, but there's some, you know, under some, there's some rules associated with that, but in general. So, but we kind of liked picking, because this was a group where it would help to have features, we wanted to embed the features in the names to help people remember that, and also to justify, you know, it's sort of unusual to have a bunch, so many new genera, but it's also unusual that you have a group that's so without genera. 
you know, where it's all one big, you know, well, they're all going to be a kind of bothrium, and it doesn't help you at all when you find one in terms of predicting its morphology and its lifestyle and so on versus dividing them up so you can. Because again, now I can tell you, like, if you find a triacid shark, so a smooth hound shark, you're not going to get these in that shark. That's how predictive it is. You know, I can tell you without even looking, and I've tested this, actually, yeah, w triacids are going to have species of coronacestus. If they don't, then it's really interesting. And that's what's also useful, and we'll come back to that. So, okay. So, all right, so, I, did I convince you? Do you buy it? Yeah. Sort of, as long as it's stable. Okay, so I wanted to do one more thing with this topic because this is the thing that has caused most controversy, I would argue, in terms of our research, but it's something that needed to be done and we thought we would just go out and do it, and that is, these are the establishing robust natural groupings. We have actually recently worked to dismantle especially this order of tapeworms, which has bumped up the number of orders of tapeworms recognized. And I want to point out that um, we actually have a grad student in my department, Peter Niskrecki, who was party to discovering a new order of insect, and it was like all over the news. We just did three new orders of tapeworms. Nobody really cares. So, you know, we were, but the point is that it's the same category of classification, and we should, have just, we should take just as much care to make our groups natural just because not as many people work on them and they're not as diverse. That should be something we all aspire to as evolutionary biologists. So from our tree of evolutionary relationships, it turned out we could recognize three really robust clades suites of species that still allowed us, don't worry about the names on here, that still allowed us to keep the other groups monophyletic. Okay, and so we've actually gone ahead and erected these three um, as new orders, and we were lucky to actually make the cover of the International Journal of Parasitology with every single one of them, which we're kind of proud of, because they're really nice pictures. Um, and this was actually, the, this is actually not the new order, that's the reorganization of the Diphylidians. Okay, but the point is like, it's real. We think this has made it a lot more useful and predictive. The most controversial order is this order, which is taking some elasmobranch tapeworms and adding them to tapeworms that live in bony fish. And that has made the people who work on bony fish tapeworms very upset because we've changed the order for their tapeworm group. But this has been a concept in the literature, like the more and more data we get, the more robust that, that phenomenon appears to be. So we went ahead and did it just this actually about a month ago. Okay, so now we've basically moved from this to that kind of a scenario. However, the reason this name is in quotes is because what seems to still be the case is this group is still not natural. It's actually distributed all across the tree, but we don't know how to fix it, and we don't want to fix it and then have to refix it because people like you would be mad at us. So we want to wait till we know exactly, or we have a better idea of where we could more stably generate boundaries for that group. So right now we're up to you know, nine orders, and there will have to be more if we're going to accommodate the variation we're seeing in that group. Okay, but again, always in an evolutionary context. All right, now we're going to do like the horror of our research program. I originally started working, my PhD is actually not in tapeworms of elasmobranchs, it's on freshwater fish digenians, which are so boring in comparison, I can't tell you. <laughs> the reason I, de I moved from that field to this field is because I wanted to study coevolution, and the tape, the, um, the digenians, the flukes of freshwater fish are not necessarily that host specific. And it was the notion that if you want to study coevolution, you should pick a system where there's tight host specificity. And that certainly is what we've been finding in the elasmobranch tapeworms. So when I came to UConn, I actually switched my research program to work on tapeworms of elasmobranchs, ultimately with the goal of generating a phylogenetic tree for the host, generating a phylogenetic tree for the parasites, looking at the coevolutionary relationships so we could actually start getting into some of the process level questions that. Kent was talking about. So we wanted to study coevolution. Okay. So I'm actually going to give you an example of this that comes from the part of the PhD of one of my students, Carrie Filer. Okay. And so Carrie worked on tapeworms of the genus Acanthobothrium. This is her molecular phylogeny for a bunch of different species in the genus Acanthobothrium. <laughs> this is our tree for the elasmobranchs. Okay. And let's now take a look at those associations. Let's just kill ourselves now, right? So basically, what Carrie found, and this is a pattern we've now found over and over again in every system where we've done it, we are not, even though these are incredibly host specific, like if you give me or one of the students in my lab for that matter, the spiral intestine of a species of shark array we've looked at, we can take the worms out and tell you what species of host it was, absolutely, if it's one we've looked at. That's how host specific they are. Party, you know, one of those important things you want your grad students to be able to do. But, 
Nonetheless, that's the pattern we're getting over and over and over again. Now, some of that pattern we can disassemble a little bit because basically on this tree, these are all batoids, because those, those, so those are rays and their relatives. That's what Acanthobothrium, most species parasitize rays. But these are sharks, okay? And so look at, you know, how the relationships of these relative to those found in sharks are. And let me just color code that for you. So what you can see from this is, again, assuming our trees are correct, that the species of Acanthobothrium that parasitize sharks are actually, they've host hopped from other groups. So for example, consider this one, which is in Paragalius pectoralis in Senegal. This species of Acanthobothrium, its sisters are in guitar fish in Senegal. So somehow it actually was able to hop from a guitar fish, you know, one of the guitar fishes, into a shark. Okay, similarly here, here, here. So basically these are all host hopping events. Well, that's interesting, but it's not explaining the rest of this incongruence, all right? And so, so that's the host hopping sort of portrayal then. What it says is, you know, we had species that were parasitizing stingrays and they hopped down into hosts. That's interesting. But again, it's not the primary picture here. But what it did turn out to be sort of a pattern that we're now currently working to try to resolve, if you look at the geographic distributions now of these worms, okay, so forget the hosts because there's not much signal there, okay, the covolutionary signal is very weak. Let's just look at the geographic distributions of those. And I'm going to just do Atlantic, Indo-Pacific and the rivers of South America, because it actually turns out the freshwater stingrays of South America actually do have some parasites. Okay, perfect. Okay, well look at that. Well, it turns out this is actually a clade, a group, that's found in the Indo-Pacific, and this is a group that's found in the Atlantic with some variation in between. And in those regions, you know, so we can sort of go through those regions, they're actually found in totally different host groups. So although they're absolutely host-specific, there's no coevolution there, and instead there seems to be a geographic signal. So we've actually started working with your graph in molecular and cell biology here to try to see if we can identify some other reasons, maybe things that might be contributing to that specificity. For example, one of the things, and this is probably like a totally wrong idea, but it's interesting, we started to look at the bacterial faunas in the guts in case they're mediating host specificity because we know that marine bacterial faunas are similar in regionally. And what if there's something actually happening, like an interface or an interaction between the tapeworm and the bacteria? So we don't know. We've just started doing that. But something, it's not coevolution, and now we need to sort of, you know, we're not having co-speciation, and maybe geography plays a role, and maybe it's mediated by some other group. Okay, so, so basically then I, I tried to go through and show you how evolution in our system sort of plays into the four different kinds of questions that we've been asking um, over the last few decades. And I just wanted to, to remind you then that all this you know, information is available at tapeworms.ucon.edu. This is actually the website for a planetary biodiversity inventory project we have funded by NSF. But we've linked everything to this website. The databases, the host databases are here. This gets you into the tapeworm database, and there's a citations database as well. So next time it's Shark Week, <laughs> I want you to just see right through that to the beauty within. <laughs> Thank you. When your students go come into your lab, how do you help them find the information about the species name changes? Where do you start? They're all in the database. That is so the SESTA portion of the database. In fact, whoever is who does interlibrary loan at this library because they're not here. They have been so helpful to us, I can't tell you, because a lot of it's really obscure literature. So we have to go and look at it and actually see what the name is. And then we have a page for each nominal species, and we put all of that information into fields in that page. So it's a now, and it's not just available to my students, it's available to anybody in the world, because that was one of the impediments to taxonomy was everybody, every time someone wanted to work on a group, they had to go find the old literature, and they had to look at, you know, now it's available, you know, the information's available now. So, yeah. So I have a question about the relationship between um, morphology and the genetic characters in the Diphylidia. Um, this might work better if we can pull the tree up. It's a slightly involved question, but I'm hoping people will find the discussion interesting. Um, I don't care. We're talking about <laughs> characters. Okay, so in, in okay wait, which, in let's see. Let's go to um, that tree. Yeah, that will okay, work. Okay, okay. Um, so in drawing the new, the new genera. Um, oh, no, wait. Do the one. Yeah, I see which one. Let's do... Um, 
Let's go to the carrot. The, there, oops. We'll just use that one. Okay. So currently you generate, you're looking for natural monophyletic. Right, groups. right. Um, but what you consider, if monophyletic means um, descent from a common ancestor, then where you draw that line is kind of arbitrary. I mean, you, you could argue um, to some extent that uh, Ahamelina and um, Endocodonicum and that set is all monophyletic from Absolutely. the ancestors far yes. further back. Yep. Um, but from your just so you could say, okay, well, we're gonna look for monophyletic groups um, combined with morphological characters and that, that synthesis. But what it sounded like when you were describing it is that the the taxonomy is based on the molecular data alone, and we just look for the characters to tell you how to find them in the field. No, so that's a good point. So, so we generate the tree using molecular characters now. We don't move forward with any reclass, my lab certainly doesn't, any reclassification renaming until we've actually gone back, looked at the morphology, and Kent sort of alluded to this, see if we can find things that tie the group together. Because you're absolutely right. Like, the, so, because remember, I could have gone, these are all a kind of bothria. Mm -hmm. The information content there is zero. Because you, there's no predictability, you know what I mean? Like, it, it, yes, they're all diphylidians. I'm making the order and the genus synonymous, right? So the point is, like, what helps you most? As long as you have nat, like, because the natural groups mean they have a shared history, and that means you can start making predictions about it. That's why in this group, so I could have even done this, right? I could have said these are all one group, but then I'm not capturing. Those are just in triacid sharks, and they have that corona of hooks. You know what I mean? So you're trying to do the maximum information content you can of the combination of the molecules and the morphology. But the thing to remember is that's why we moved away from doing trees with just morphology. The morphology is often difficult to interpret and it can be, you can have the same feature appearing a couple of times, which means it'll mislead you. You know, so if you have a molecular tree with a bunch of different genes, you get the same answer, and then you start looking at the morphology, then you can come up, but you, you are, it is, there is an element of subjectivity there, but for us it's like about, yes, but you're using the maximizing information content to direct where you're going to make the boundaries. Cool. Thank you. Oh, yes. So um, I'm just wondering how um, organisms like from one generation to another, how do they get transmitted? Is it from live birds from parent to... You took that slide out. So um, <laughs> they, have a, <laughs> they have a really complex life cycle. So basically, um, the, it's all tapeworms move through the food chain. So the shark gets infected, or ray, when it eats a fish or a crab that has a larva, okay, that fish or crab got infected when it ate like a little copepod or something that had the previous larva, and so on and so on. So basically, the proglottids inside, you know, the parts of the body inside the elasmobranch poop out eggs, poop out as in they go out with the poop of the elasmobranch, get consumed by little copepods, you get the first larval stage, it gets eaten by some little crustacean or little fish, you get the second larval state, you know, so it's totally through the food chain. But one of the most unknown elements of the system is we haven't <coughs> made many of the connections between those life cycle stages because the larvae are just blobs. And until we know, we can't ID that we, they don't have the adult features. The adult features are what the taxonomy is based on. But now again, <coughs> molecules are helpful because we're able to match a bunch of those up. So, so the, the shark can, for example, the shark can ingest a bunch of um, Yep. Maybe, but it turns out that's not the only thing that's driving it. Because like at Camp the Bathroom, where I showed you the tree, Carrie's tree, those are all the same morphology of skull legs. And they live in a whole bunch of different, so, some, so there's, that's explaining some of it. What we don't understand is exactly what you just said. We don't understand why, like a shark, like a gummy shark off the coast here eats 66 species of things. Mm -hmm. And it has like four species of tapeworms. We know it's picking up larvae of other things. Why don't those infections take? We don't know. Is it the immune system? Is it maybe... I'm just going to say bacterial mediation one more time because it's intriguing. But we don't actually know. You know, we used to think, and maybe it's physiology, maybe the gut physiology, since they're absorbing through their outer surface, you know. But that's where we are right now. But we didn't deal with this until now because I always thought the trees with lack of congruence were because our methods were poor and we didn't have good sampling and we did, you know, and, and indeed a lot of it was. But now we've been able to confirm, no, there isn't, co there isn't a large degree of co-evolution between the worms and their hosts. Why not? That's the intriguing question now that we can now move towards answering because I'm, it's like we're not explaining a paper tiger anymore. It's the tiger and now we're going to figure it out. So, so there's a possibility that you branch on a whole new direction, for example, you might look at the immunology or yeah. 
Yeah. Well, me or or maybe one of my students, because like my goal is that 1,300 species of a Lazarine tape works. <laughs> But I mean, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, I guess what it shows is the power that when you start looking at evolutionary relationships, the power in terms of the questions it generates are spectacular. But you have to have solid, you have to have done that work. You know, it, we worked 20 years before we had any trees, you know, and now we're like, no, it's the best. This is the most well, uh, I'm saying it out loud, this is probably the most well known host parasite system right now because we're positive the host IDs, we're positive the associations, the worm IDs are good. So now we can actually start, you know, wrangling with some interesting questions. Hopefully, basic parasitological questions. Are we done? Oh, you had a question. Oh. Oh. So, so many. There's such diversity of tapeworms and sharks and rays, more so than other species. Is that because they're one of the oldest hosts out there, or why do you think that is? It's an interesting question. Here's why I think it is. So, if you look at um, the, the biodiversity profile of, say, let's do a bony fish, same environment, okay, but a whole different group, you know, the Lazarus banks are one <coughs> monophyletic group, the bony fish are another one. By far the majority of parasites you find in their gut are flukes, so digenians, a different group of platyhelminths. And it's almost like, and, and in Lazarus ranks, you don't find flukes in the intest spiral intestine. If you find them, they're in weird places like the pericardial cavity, the body cavity. We actually got them off the gills, which is unknown because they're supposed to be internal parasites. You know, so it's almost like there's been this displacement of, you know, so the flukes are kind of where it's at in bony fish. They don't have that many tapeworms. What's in elasmobranchs are the tapeworms. So it's almost like, you know, is, is it a matter of like a missing the boat phenomenon where, where bony, you know, because there's only so much space for parasites in something. And the different groups of vertebrates seem to be dominated by different taxa. Like, for example, if you were to do mammals, in a lot of cases, nematodes would be the most common group. You know, so, so we're, we're sort of, because we're only now getting to the, like, when I first started this, people seriously thought that tapeworms were the most diverse, that the, it was a perception that tapeworms were the most diverse parasite taxa on the lazarites because everybody likes them, because they're, they're morphologically beautiful. Now we've done, when we do these projects, a lot of time we do survey work, where we'll go into an area and we'll do like, we had a project in the Gulf of California where we did all elasmobranchs, all metazoan parasites. So we did full necropsies. And there's where we know like from those kinds of data, it's all about tapeworms. Like we have negative data saying, we looked in the other sites, we looked for the other taxa and they're not there. You know, so, so it's interesting, but it does seem like there's this like separation and is it historical? Because truth be told, elasmobranchs and bony fish probably are about the same age. You know, if you get back to, depending on where you do that ancestor, it's probably not the case that they're, an older group, and the, yeah, but it definitely has something to do, like it's almost like there's an element of competition that's come into play, and it might be historically driven, like something got in and then diversified, but, yeah. There's not a physiological character like pH or something that might drive distinctions between one and the other? Well, what's interesting is there's a group of internal parasites called the acanthocephalins, and you don't get those in elasmobranchs, pretty much, okay? And it's true you don't get other groups, but that one's, it's one that's kind of intriguing. There's a couple of species described, but not many. And work was done some years ago by a person in Britain called Happy Williams who showed that they don't do well with high concentrations of urea. Elasmobranchs osmoregulate using urea. So maybe that's a case where you can explain the lack of, you know, acanthocephalins because it physiologically isn't a viable environment for them. Yeah? This might be scratch. But I'm wondering if you would see um, these changes in these relationships as we go through global climate change, you know, and how the species adapt, and then will their internal parasites and anything else that uh, will as well? I mean, we, we aspire to have the kind of data where we could answer that question. One of the challenges for all of us who do sort of basic biology is, it is sometimes hard to get the support to do the basic biology. That having been said, we've been really well supported because tapeworms are obviously very cool. Um, but it means you don't have the baseline data to do the comparison. Now we do, but it's as of now almost. So now, yes, henceforth we could look at it. That having been said, I'm not sure of the time frame. Like what we might see is we'll have species that disappear, not evolutionarily, but because of the issue of the complex life cycle. So sometimes parasites with complex life cycles are terrific indicators of environmental you know, destruction because when their intermediate hosts go, they go in some cases, right? That having been said, there's some really interesting studies that were done by Dave Mark Glacy and his coll coll collaborators in Canada that show that under certain circumstances, certain groups of parasites will bump up their numbers. So you have to know how they're responding to different kinds of environmental perturbation. But 
you can't, there's no getting away from the fact that if we had really terrific baseline data, we'd know way more about what was happening on the planet. But it's tricky because it takes, you know, like I said, this is 20 years worth of, it's more than that actually, of work. And I can finally say after like, no, 20, when did we come? 28 years. Yeah, we got the system down. <laughs> and normally NSF is like, um, wow, we've moved on to other things now. You know, so that's <laughs> <laughs> so good. Yeah. So we are actually at the end of the session, um, but we wanted to include, uh, as mentioned in yesterday's afternoon session, we wanted to include something about um, information seeking and uh, data storage. Both of the speakers have mentioned that somewhat. Does anyone have questions related to I that? I think Ken should come back up here, don't you? Okay, sure. <laughs> back up. So uh, we had um, potential questions like about how you find information, how, how your search skills and your student search skills are. Um, does anyone have specific questions you want to ask related to that? We'll, we'll extend it another five minutes just so we can make sure we can include those questions if anyone has them. So we'll start off with the same question we started off with yesterday. How effective are your and your students' literature search skills? What might you from your perspective? I brought you the most. It's hard, it's hard to say how effective they are because, I mean, students now search the literature so differently from the way I learned to search it. Because, you know, I go down and I, we, I walk through the new journals every week when they came into the library to see what was happening. And you were just aware of it. And, I mean, there were computer databases you could search, but they weren't very good. And so, and so, I, I, so for me, I'm still very journal-based. I still have this list of journals I look at and I sort of check the tables of contents regularly. My students, um, they just sort of go on and do Google Scholar immediately and look for things whenever they're interested in do keyword searches. And they seem mostly to find things but are not aware of the older historical literature. And I would say that's true of my students except for the taxonomic data because that's what our database is about. And one of the things I aspire to do but not very effectively is to get my students to contribute to the database because we're constantly, people are describing new species, we are in fact, all the time, but it's hard to get people to enter the data. Everyone uses the database. No one wants to enter the data into the database. It's interesting. So we're aspiring to try to, we actually have an international workshop on cestodes in Brazil in August. We're actually gonna have a day of databasing to try to get, you know, the global community has contributed substantially to this database. But we're gonna try to make it so that every year, or every third year, because they're three year workshops, when we meet, that would be one of the events that we do, just to keep it sort of up to date. And some people are better about it than others, but quite frankly, the, the updating the database was done best when I actually paid someone to do the databasing. That's the truth, because they get really good at it and they can be effective. So. Yeah. One thing that's different in, in ecology and evolutionary biology is, I, in some ways, I, I don't think we make as big a deal about how interdisciplinary because we do it already. I mean, if you think about the kinds of data that Jean and our I are collecting, I mean, we're collecting molecular sequence data. I have a, essentially a molecular lab where we do DNA extractions and all those same sorts of things as a, as a molecular biology lab would do. At the same time, I collaborate heavily with people in our statistics departments developing new statistical analysis technique is just part of what you have to do to get the work done. And, and you just naturally draw on all sorts of fields. So we, you know, we have soil moisture meters, we do chlorophyll fluorescence, we do photosynthetic physiology. It's just part of what you do to get the data. Yeah, no, I would agree. I mean, one of the things for us that's very interdisciplinary compared to what we used to do in parasitology is the host element. Now we are totally collaborating with the host people all of the time. They use the database, we'll update it for them, we'll change names when they tell us something's happened. You know, but that's still sort of an organismal sort of element of it, but it, it, it ties into sort of what we do. But again, methods wise, I actually don't have a molecular lab. My students, all of whom do sequence work, actually work in the lab of one of my colleagues, Dr. Elizabeth Jockish, also in my department. And our department kind of has a centralized molecular lab so that all of our grad <coughs> students, or many of them actually work together. And then it's great because you know, my, one of my students just learned from a botanist in the department about a process she could be using and so on and so on. So I would agree with Ken that by, by definition almost, you know, and I have, I actually have a grant 
a joint grant with Marie Cantino in physiology and neurobiology because we purchased the new electron microscope for the biology. You know, so I think, I do think because of the fact that we do, and I would argue that's true of the ecologists in our department as well. Just by definition, those kinds of disciplines are really interdisciplinary. It seems like those core shared facilities are really important. Do you do that between, I'm at Dartmouth, and I know that they're trying to do some things where they share between departments. What, what they have, it's, as you might imagine, a little more spotty than within a department. But there, there's this idea that, um, that real interdisciplinary um, sharing of some core facilities could be useful, partly because we'd be sharing knowledge that's, that's, that's coming from very different disciplines. Is that happening at all? I'm going to answer that one first. Because yeah. I think that in concept it's a great idea, but honestly it totally depends on the people involved and the support from the institution. And you can, like we are actually a little bit frightened here at UConn that we have a great electron microscopy facility, we just got the new microscope, and now there's potentially another one setting up. And if they move ours over to that one and they don't take care about the things that are working in our facility, you know what I mean? So in concept, yes, but I think it's more likely to work within a department or a related department because otherwise it's really, it can be really tricky. So you have to be careful. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I'd say that we do have a few examples that work pretty well. What, and, I mean, in our field, one that does work pretty well is there's a biotechnology facility. And what it does is it just provides the technology to do sequencing and some computation. And, stuff. and so when it's well defined, then it actually, that, that shared resource could work pretty well. The, the, in my experience, though, the, the sort of places where you're trying to foster interdisciplinary collaboration it, it, at least at UConn, hasn't worked unless there's a group of faculty who come up with the idea and are pushing for it and then get support from them. It, it doesn't work for deans or vice provosts pushing down. Okay, Sally, I'm going there. It's Regina. So we're talking about, you know, how uh, your students are doing research and we're talking about you work with the library. Other than literature search, other than traditional library services, what roles do you see? research, science research library in your labs and research. Well, one that's come up recently I, refer, I already referred to is, is the NSF and NIH now manage, mandating the data management plans. I, I know that Martha Bedard is working with Mike Mundrain, our CIO, here to think about how, what role the library can play in the whole data management and not just serving up the data when it's at, at the end, but you know, how is it collected along the way. As Janine says, one of the ch real challenges in big collaborative projects is to make sure the data is accessible to everybody all the time and that you're always looking at the same data. And so I think there's a role, librarians are really good at curating those sorts of things, making them available, keeping them track, catalog, developing the metadata so that not just we, but colleagues across the world can find it. I think there's a real role there. And I just want to follow up on that and say, I think that one of the things that sort of speaks to that issue is the idea at UConn that we have like Carolyn as our biological librarian and she knows our journals and she knows our field and she, it's really helped. I think that was like the biggest change in our library when we went, because I've been here for decades, we didn't always have that. But we're or like even, because I mean in the end we don't want to downplay the fact that meanwhile, you guys are way better at the literature than we are. <laughs> And it's still, I hope that librarians recognize, I mean, I know you do, but that the idea that there should be some other role for libraries doesn't supersede the fact that you guys are spectacular. Like, honestly, the interlibrary, they just did 50 interlibrary loans for us yesterday for databasing this summer. Like, it's amazing. And it would take us forever to find that information. So I think, you know, I, I, yes, I think there are other roles, but I think the primary role of, you know, literature knowledge is really, really key. And, Good librarians make such a huge difference to us. So. I would also point out that Kent is, um, uh, has been very active in scholarly communication areas for some time. Are you still on the board for yeah. BioLine? He's, he's one of the board members for BioLine. Been, I've been chair since 2000. He publishes uh, open access regularly. He already has an ORCID ID, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, and I also want to point out that Janine, She's so interested in tapeworms, she does Christmas cards. She does tapeworms. <laughs> <laughs> and I, a few years ago, I got on the list. So I stay yeah. because they're so unique. Uh, Way back in the back. Uh, you, you said you were going to say something about sushi? Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> Don't, they, okay, I teach an entire class in parasitology. It's very difficult, very, lots of material. Here's the only thing. I want my students to get out of my class, and I tell them this the first day. 
And you know what it is. Cook your food. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's a simple thing. And, and don't ask her to describe why. Yeah, well, I can tell you, but it's almost lunchtime. <laughs> So, yeah, so the question is whether there's a space to learn sort of software development skills. And there's not a formal space, but, but it's informally. I mean, we are right now, the, a paper I'm working on with several other people, we're using GitHub to share the data and our scripts that we're using for analysis. So it's not like a formal training, but it's becoming more widely used. Um, and and what, actually, we're interested in getting the software coverage before we're talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Really, I'm from St. Catharines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're, if we could get them to come in, because there's increasingly, um, <coughs> as the data sets grow, get more complex, we have to share them with people. Having, you know, whether it's Python, Perl, or whatever, mm -hmm. to share them sort of automatically and automate the processing becomes so more and more important. Because the library can maybe facilitate, you know, the organization of it, it posts in to the Again, I wanted to sort of follow up on that. So we, some years ago, the Dean of CLAS put out a call for proposals, training, whatever, course proposals. And my department put together one on cyber infrastructure because we realized, although we're all using it in our research, none of us teach anything of it. And so we actually did five modules, you know, and most of them, I think, are now online. Yeah. But it's something that we would have liked to follow up on, but we don't do it, can't do it. But certainly the interest that we had in that, like all of the modules were full. I think speaks to the issue that, because kind of, in a way we're kind of leaving our students, you know, we, when we write the grant proposals, we don't necessarily include the students, we just move forward, you know, and then we hope to engage them later. But yeah, I think that's a good point. Would you consider using library science students to do the data management in your databases? The, especially the ones uh, specializing in the new data management. So in, in our taxonomy database, what we, so I actually have two McNair Scholar students this summer who are just databasing in my lab. And what we ended up having to do is taxonomy boot camp, which was really fun and they loved it. Well, I think they loved it. They appeared to love it. <laughs> so, so because they're the, the issues with the database like that are knowing the rules of taxonomy more than getting the data in. And as long as someone's open to that idea, if we could come up with something, I think that could help solve like a lot of our databasing problems around the world because, again, librarians like data. <laughs> it's, part of, it's like a passion, like we like tapeworms, he likes plant you know, so I think that that is a way maybe to, to start having more interaction between the two groups, but again, it's not just about entering the data, there are, there's like a training element that, it's, and it's not like we would mind doing the training, it's people have to be open to learning about homonyms and synonyms and, you know, all those. When you name, like for example, you talked about that tapeworm you named after NPI, Doug Berman? Doug Berman, mm-hmm. Is, is there a registry? I mean, I know you've talked about your database, but like it, if what if somebody in Australia named it something different? It's a great question. I am happy to report that Zobank is now online at the British Museum. We've been working to have a single place where people could register the names forever. And the, through politics and so on, there was it was not something that came to fruition. We always had Neve, which I don't know if some of you guys know that. That's a registry of generic names, of animal generic names. And now it's an online, you can go to Neve, I forget what the, what, if you just Google Neve, you can find it. But now with Zobank, and now the taxonomic journals are requiring you to register your name with Zobank and put the number in your paper. So I actually think that's gonna move things forward tremendously because then there is a single place, and right, you don't end up with two names for the same thing or, you know. Yeah. So there, now there is a complication you should be aware of, which are, is there are 
five different nomenclatural codes, covered named different pieces of the world. And so she was talking about the zoological code. The botanical code doesn't have registration. So there's no requirement. Now, effectively, the index QNSIS, as far as most people are aware, captures virtually every name that gets published. And so you can't find it. But it's not required that it be registered in any way. And there have been proposals uh, at the International Botanical Congress to do that since at least <laughs> the mid-90s. Uh, and they have not yet passed for various reasons. So wh whether or when that will happen, and, and, and the way the codes are governed is very different too. There's like a permanent bureau of nomenclature for zoological nomenclature. There isn't for plants. Um, it's yeah. But my thought is, once if Zobank gets up and running, I think the plant people will, you know, because yeah. it, everybody, it, it was just politics over who would own it, as far as I can tell. Right? Who would be the keeper of Zobank? Who cares? Just get it up there. I don't care who keeps it. It's on the lot web. So, so yeah. So it's noon. We're actually 15 minutes past, but it was such a great session. I didn't want to cut it off. Um, so thank you.